So I think a key message is, you know, in general, we're getting into a regime where in order to stay on this Moore's Law trend, we're going to have to do, we're, we're having to do lots and lots of complicated things. Either we throw lots of masks at the problem or we go to technologies that are really expensive and complicated and hard. So managing the cost of patterning, you know, as I mentioned, lithography is, you know, becoming, you know, 40, 50 percent of the total cost of making a chip. How do you minimize the cost of patterning and still deliver density? You know, that's sort of become as important as the technical details of how to print these patterns. So the next big decision we have is really this. Um, ARF multiple pass patterning, you know, using three, four masks to do these cuts. Uh, it's technically feasible. It's not that complicated to do, you know, but it's expensive. And of course, it has all these design rule complications. Maybe your overlay, you've got to manage all these things. You know. UV patterning, on the other hand, is technically very complex, right? But it has this potential to be cost effective. Um, and so if we can get the source power and the uptime and all these things to where we need it to be, then this is UV, I think, will be a very um, interesting candidate for the next generation. So we're all working on the same thing, which is, you know, how do we get the UV source performance over the next two years? We need to watch how it evolves and then decide, you know, for the 10 nanometer node and the 7 nanometer node that's, you know, in, in two years or four years, uh, depending on the performance of the UV scanner, we'll have to make a decision. You know, do we do we take the ugly approach, but it's a known quantity, which is multiple ARF masks, or do we go with this cool approach, UV, but that assumes, of course, that it has the performance needed to make it cost effective. Um, so I focused uh, so far primarily on ARF and EUV. Any, any questions on that? I have some other, other techniques. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the other techniques, but, uh, but I will mention Byte. So there was another technology called 157, uh, which was an F2 laser that was used. But it turned out to be not enough of a pop from 193. So the delta or the ratio of 157 to 193 wasn't that great. So it didn't give you enough improvement. And the problems it had, you know, in 157, you're going to, we're getting into a regime where water, moisture, and the air absorbs light now. So you've got to go to a vacuum type system. And so it, it turned out that it, it incurred a lot of disadvantages without providing enough of an advantage. So there was a lot of work that went into, you know, uh, 157, but it was eventually abandoned. And so the next practical node is the 13 and a half. Okay, uh, there are other technologies out there. Um, I have not, I'm not going to spend as much time on it because none of them really is ready for prime time at this point. Uh, but I will mention them, and if anybody's interested, you know, I can discuss some more uh, or in greater detail. So the first one, and probably the one that is, you know, uh, has, has garnered a lot of interest, is this thing called multiple uh, parallel e-beam direct write. So you have multiple e-beams uh, that are all controlled by some computer, each of which, you know, so if you're talking about, you know, thousands or even millions of beams, and each of which writes a small fraction of the chip. Right? So it's a maskless technology. There's no mask needed. It just directly writes the pattern. Um, and so you have different companies that have different approaches, but basically the general idea is the same. You know, you have a beam, you know, you have multiple small beams, and they're all controlled by some uh, this blanker array and deflector. You know, this is basically a computer that controls which beams turn on and off and how you move these beams to write the whole chip. Right? So there are different approaches being taken, but basically the, the way that generally they have is they have, a, you know, the, the way conceptually the companies are positioning this is you have a unit that can do perhaps 10 wafers an hour, and then you have a cluster tool that has 10 of these units each one doing 10 wafers an hour, so the whole tool uh, runs about 100 wafers an hour, for example. So there are a lot of, a lot of different approaches that are being considered. Uh, we have prototype tools out there that are being looked at uh, in usually mostly in industry consortia. There are a few uh, prototype tools that have trickled down into actual factories, uh, not to make anything sellable, of course, more just for R&D. 
Um, so there's examples, uh, you know, Mapper is the name of one company that, uh, you know, has shown these interesting results, these dots and, you know, small patterns. Um, and um, so could eBeam direct write, for example, be used to cut these lines? You created your grading. Could you use the eBeam direct write to go, you know, have a, cut all these different spots? Right? That's a possibility. Um, so you only have one conventional exposure, which is the original exposure to print the grading, and after that you go in with your e-beam and then do all the cuts. You know, so sounds pretty nice. Uh, keep the costs down. Um, the, the issue is, of course, that there there is no e-beam tool available at this point. Uh, so, like I said, the current status is there are a lot of prototyping activities that are ongoing. Uh, there are two main players, and you know, there are others, but I think from a wafer standpoint. Uh, the two main players are the Mapper Technology in the Netherlands uh, and KLA 10 Core, which is a big equipment manufacturer in the U.S. Uh, and then both these programs are in a prototyping phase with alpha tools, you know, sort of basic engineering type tools, not a high volume. Maybe it doesn't have all the other alignment and all these other subsystems integrated quite yet. Uh, so more for demonstrating the technology than for actually making a real chip. Um, and I, I can't remember the exact dates when they're targeting HVM, but it's somewhere in the 2015 to 2016 time frame. They think that they will have a real uh, piece of equipment that can actually be used in a factory to make real chips, right? So now getting from a prototype to that is, is not trivial. Uh, you have to get the run rates up, and then you have to integrate all these other components like alignment and so on, which, which are just as important, right? So, there are a lot of technical challenges to scale this technology up to HVM, but it's intriguing and it's very, very, if it works, it's, it's a disruptive technology in that it circumvents a lot of the problems that the conventional approaches have uh, struggled with. Another one that's, um, you know, uh, has a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of effort both in academia as well as uh, in the industry side is directed self-assembly. And um, I'll talk about a little bit more about how it's done in the next slide, but it has the potential for be a low cost solution for a part of the pro patterning process. It's, pr it's probably, I don't envisage a scenario where DSA is going to replace ARF or it's going to replace UV or anything like that, but it can, I think, enhance or um, uh, support, in a supporting role, provide some key, key capabilities. Uh, preliminary data looks pretty promising, uh, and so there are a lot of requirements here. A lot of it's a big chemistry problem designing these molecules that will self-assemble basically into you know features that are you know, tight pitches like this. Um, and so uh, again, it's a fairly significant amount of research activity going on. So here's one possible uh, way by which this is done. So you need, a, you need some kind of a pre-pattern. You know, you, so you create this sort of guide pattern, it's called, that's shown right there. And then you spin some polymer coat, the, the pink stuff, between these. And then through some kind of treatment, and, and this polymer has basically two sides to it. So it's an A and a B, which orient themselves, right? So through the right kind of treatment, you have this sort of assembling itself in this form, you know, so the, the pink turns into a blue and red alternating phase pattern, and one of these is soluble and the other one isn't. For example, the blue stuff is soluble, so you get rid of it, and then, or, you know, the red one is soluble, whatever, depending on which way you design it. And so, you know, depending on the type of polymer, you know, it may split the original pattern into three, or it could be into five, or, you know, six, or, you know, whatever, some even number or, or um, probably an odd number, but um, um, essentially you can, you can split this into multiple you know, uh, features that are uh, smaller than the original pitch that you started off with, which you can then transfer. Right? So, um, so it's very interesting. Um, it has a lot of practical complications. How do you make sure that these, these separate in this particular way perfectly across the whole wafer without defects, right? So if I go back a slide, you know, this perfect example are these kinds of defects where, you know, things look pretty good over here and then something happened and then you get all weird over here. Right? So obviously that's not going to be very good on a real circuit. So the goal is, you know, how do you ensure that it's reliably, you know, uniform and defect-free all over the place? 
the defectivity levels for this approach are you know, probably several orders of magnitude higher than what we can tolerate to make a microprocessor. And so it's not really, at this time, it's not anywhere close to where we need to be. You know, it's an example, just as a nice picture uh, from a lithography conference. So you can pretty much see no defects you know, from one end to the other, but that doesn't mean it's, it's not going to be there. And so but pretty reasonable performance, I'd say. It looks best for making breaking. Yes, it does. Absolutely. And so the place where they're looking at this very, very seriously is things like making hard disks, you know, where you can tolerate a fairly high level of error. Right? So you just have more sectors, and you can just say, OK, 10% of the sectors on your hard disk are, you, are bad, whatever. So the redundancy is much, much higher on a hard disk than it is in an actual microprocessor. So you know, it's very seriously being looked at for making hard disks. Uh, in fact, uh, Hitachi had some very nice papers, uh, I think in a SPIE, which is a big uh, um, conference, uh, optical lithography conference here in uh, San Jose uh, every year. And so I think last year they had a great paper with a lot of details. and almost looked like they were you know, almost ready to take that into their you know, either R&D or manufacturing level. So a lot of research going on, uh, both on the academic and the industry side. Uh, I think the defect levels are too high for ICs. Definitely, I think they're within the range where the hard disk guys are taking a very, very serious look at this. Um, you need a lot more improvement before it's ready for us. And so, you know, or, you know we, we have to see creative ways by which there are techniques that we are looking at that it's not so much for pitch division, but for doing other things that uh, it's more of an enhancement to existing patterning techniques that we're looking at. So there are ways to use DSA uh, that uh, perhaps uh, don't incur the problems, the defectivity problems that, that uh, I've shown here. Uh, so we're looking at that kind of stuff. So these are all, you know, more speculative, you know, techniques that are probably, you know, three, four years out as best. Um, so we'll have to see how these things evolve. You know, all the people in the industry are keeping a close eye on this. Some of us are participating in different ways through industry consortia. Uh, and hopefully over the next two, three years, we'll get a little more clarity into whether any of these techniques are going to pan out. So there's this thing called complementary lithography, right? This is a term, again, that's used fairly f uh, commonly these days, which is, again, that use a good, te easy technique to do your grading and then use an, a different kind of technique to do your cuts. It could be multiple masks. It could be E-beam e direct right. It could be uh, UV. So they complement each other. So this example that I showed, you as one, one mask to do your your grading, and then four masks to do your cuts. That's a total of five masks to do this, this particular, say, a metal level. Or you have one mask to do your grading, and then one UV exposure. That's just two masks, right? So can you, can you use, you know, you have a lot of different techniques out there at your disposal, each of which has their advantages and disadvantages. Can you use these in a complementary way? Uh, so th the final answer is never going to be AR or EUV or something else. It's going to be some mixture of, the, of these things. That's where I think things are shaping up. So I'm fairly certain that ARF pitch division and EUV you know, certainly will be the mainstays of patterning for the upcoming nodes. And it's EUV pitch division until, AR, until EUV becomes real. And between the two of them, they're probably going to be the main um, uh, uh, mainstays of patterning. And so some of these alternatives, you know, uh, E-beam direct right and so on, uh, need a lot more work to be ready for high volume manufacturing. So, and, and the key point to take away is some of these alternatives don't have to replace UV or ARF pitch division. They have their niches, they have, their, uh, they have these you know, uh, um, nice features they bring to the table. And so the goal is you know, how do you make use of those uh, to complement the conventional patterning as opposed to displace them. So this is really the best path for not only improving the conventional patterning uh, cost of ownership, but really to get some of these elegant alternatives into the HVM picture. You know, maybe the first step is to get them in this complementary role, and then once they are established in HVM and more development has gone on, maybe they can take a more, uh, uh, more basic role in patterning. So you know, I showed this trend right at the beginning, and so the bottom line is the cost of ownership of lithography is threatening this trend. You know, this assumes that your ability to make a chip with twice as many transistors, there's a certain cost 
factor associated with this. If your UV is deviating from that trend, then um, it's going to affect our ability to make these chips. Uh, so it's very important for us to, you know, while, while the technical performance is important, you know, the cost is equally important, and that's the phase we're in in lithography right now. So the challenge is, if you look at all the different masking levels, isolation, gate contact, you know, metal levels, how many ever they are. Basically, how many layers do you need to use double patterning, complicated double patterning techniques? Can we make double patterning cheaper? Are there tricks you can use, you know, uh, that you can make double patterning cheaper? Uh, what are the keys to making EUV affordable, right? So uh, technical uh, capabilities. And finally, are there any of these game changers that we can bring in disruptive approaches, multiple e-beam direct drive DSA, to really affect uh, the cost of ownership picture. So all of these are active areas of focus. So lithography is really starting to be, you know, um, fairly complicated from an um, industry development standpoint because we have to do a lot of different things in parallel because there's no clear picture on, you know, how things are going to shape up in three, four, five years. So definitely, you know, minimize the number of complicated layers. You know, if you have a layout like this, you know, wh what are the key layers for area scaling? Um, can, can you focus on just those? Can you look at alternative layouts that make patterning a little bit easier? You know, some of these steps, like I mentioned, we've already taken. Uh, there may be more things we can do. Uh, so these are all um, active areas of discussion between design groups, uh, device uh, uh, people, and the lithographers to make sure that we can come up with uh, the right kind of compromises. So extracting area scaling while keeping litho complexity to a minimum, right, it's, it's very, very important. So I'd, I'd summarize now. Um, so Moore's Law continues to be relevant today. I think it's really important that we don't lose track of how the, 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 the simple fact of you know, doubling the transistor count every two years, uh, having the area every two years, how important that's been to the evolution of computer technology. And so device scaling, you know, being able to print feature sizes smaller is crucial for, for controlling the cost and delivering value to the customer. And so, you know, from a lithographer standpoint, our imperative is to deliver scaling solutions through, through the use of advanced lithography only where necessary. And what I mean by that is really keep cost in focus. It's easy to, you know, as, as a technical person, it's easy through, to provide technical solutions for everything. But we have to make sure that you, you provide the right technical solution so that the overall uh, cost is, uh, is kept. Uh, you don't forget that. And the only way to do that is to integrate design, lithography, device, and process, all these different things, uh, so that you can make this holistic decision uh, that's right for the chip as opposed to one or the other. Right? And so managing cost of ownership, new lithography, is the biggest challenge facing us. I personally, uh, you know, the technical problem is hard, uh, but I spend probably more time worrying about the cost of what I'm doing as opposed to the technical stuff. Uh, and so you have to make a lot of smart decisions in identifying the right kind of techniques that you can use for each application. Right. Thank you very much.